Okay, so today is the 22nd of January 2013. We're interviewing Bob Cullen at the School of Architecture at UQ, and uh, here interviewing you is Robert Riddell and myself, Janina Jose. So, first question uh, What architecture qualifications did you gain and from which institutions? Well, I've got a, a diploma in architecture, um, which was a combined effort from the Central Technical College, which turned into the, what is it called, Q -U -T. Q -U -T. Mm. the Central Technical College and the University of Queensland. Um, the first three years, the, the whole course for Diploma in Architecture was um, um, part-time, and uh, the reason I did that is that I wasn't very brainy in the Physics and Chemistry Department and you didn't have to do as much of that in the diploma course, which was a good course in the sense it was from extraordinarily practical. Mm. Um, things were very different to the way young people are educated today. And um, so the, the, from the, uh, the uh, technical college, we used to go do all our um, lectures at night mm. and um, work in an office during the day, and then the same thing when we came to the university, we joined up with the similar year and they had done their first three years full time and then we joined them and we all did part time for the last three years and had to find a job with an architect. And uh, what year did you uh, start? Um, I must have started in about 1955, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I think I left school at 1954. Because when I have school reunions, that's like we're the class of 54, I think. So, yeah. so where did you go to school? At Churchy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I had um, I've got one friend from there who, um, we were at Churchy together, but we also at State School together as, as five-year-olds, Robin Spencer, oh. who runs his own practice. And Robin and I have known each other since we were five years old, and we still see each other and have a lot of laughs. Uh, so and we both went to church and we both did architecture. So it's a, you know, just a by the by sort of. Mm. Thing. Well, they're, they're on our list. Interesting to talk thing, to, both you know, of them. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, um, and so, yeah. where did you start? You worked part time when you started. Do you yes. remember where you? Were oh yes, working? I worked for Moulds and McMinn. Mm -hmm. M O U L D S, Moulds and McMinn. Uh, Tommy and Bill, they both spent a lot of lunches at the. United <laughs> Service Club, and I became their, their driver. And uh, I get the phone call, young Bob, bring the Plymouth round. We're up the club. So off I'd go in the Plymouth. Or I'd take the Ford V8, or then Tommy bought his wife a little Mini, and I used to run the kids, uh, not a Mini, a Morris Minor, with the headlights in, not out, so mm -hmm. very early. Low light. Yes, low light. And I used to take heard the, the McMinn children about in that quite often and um, they were good blokes to work for they were still of the almost the old-fashioned era of when there was a good fire you hopped in the Ford V8 and raced behind the <laughs> fire wagons <laughs> but um, with cards with cards <laughs> but they were very they were good bosses and I got the princely sum of three pounds a week I distinctly mm -hmm. remember that three pounds a week for that and uh, we worked in a building at South Brisbane 99 Stanley Street which is long gone which was reputed to have been a brothel for the African-American soldiers during the war who were not allowed of course to cross the Victoria Bridge they were not allowed into the main part of the city and um, we so that it was a big central section it was a timber frame building big central section and it had rooms all down the side one side was Moles and McMinn, and the other side was R.J. McWilliam and Partners, or R.J. McWilliam only in that day, those days. And um, R.J. was there, racing about like a madman, and John Day and Dave Stewart, who went on to work, particularly John Day, with Robin Gibson on engineering projects and things like that. So that was, that was the early days of R.J. McWilliam and with Moles and McMinn. So how long did you stay there? I must have stayed there uh, a couple of years, I think. Mm -hmm. 
And then I went to work for Theo Thine and Associates. Mm -hmm. And beyond driving the car, did you work on some projects at Molten Lake Mini? Well? I did. I can't really remember mm -hmm. what I worked on, Yanina. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a very, un I have a fairly undistinguished career um, in many respects, in that I've only ever worked in very small buildings, mm -hmm. which is what I chose to do in the end anyway. But um, I can't, I really can't remember what we did at Miles and McNeil. Mm -hmm. um, my, I suppose my biggest memory is that I was a very useful uh, gopher. Mm -hmm. And of course you didn't know much at, straight out of school and into the office. But, but was there somebody there to teach you? Oh you yes, uh, the, the blokes in the office, mm -hmm. Bruce Nowland, um, um, who else, Nev Miller, and uh, Peter Cheney, and they'd sit there and say, now listen here young Bob, you know, this is how you do your lettering, and it's not called printing, it's called lettering. And, you know, this is how you cut a piece of paper, and this is how you draft, and so on. So that those guys were a great help, and a great source of fun, really. We had, it was a very enjoyable experience, really. And, um, um, yeah. And we had a, a, a very voluptuous secretary, and we all used to joke about how Tommy used to keep calling her in, and you know, and it's in those days of where there was take a letter, where you know, take a letter, <laughs> Celine, take a letter. You know. and it was in those days of uh, way before any uh, feeling that that was wrong, you know, to be ogling your secretary and all this sort of thing. So I, 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 I shouldn't say that in front of you, you know, because no, that's fine. The, uh, social mores have changed hugely, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm afraid my, my reminiscence of that period is one more of um, life experience than architectural mm. wonderment. Mm. You know, it's, it's the sort of thing that happens. Well, I, I followed you in that path. I, I worked for Bill Moles. Did you? Ah, oh, truly. Because Tommy died. Yeah. Yes, he got... Ten years later. He swallowed a toothpick at a party. Really? And got a terrible infection and killed him. <laughs> How tragic. Yes. Sorry. So did you do the same? You went to Moles, the Bill Moles? Oh, yes. Yeah, among a lot, lot of firms I worked for, yeah. but I did time oh, for Bill. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I too was the driver, but yes. it was a humbug. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yes, that's right. But the clubs, I think, were the same. It was... You know, oh yes, the U U U.S. club mates, basically. Went to a different club every day. Yeah. Oh yes, Major Moles, as he was known as. And the club. boat, Crookie's boat. Ah. He used to go fishing quite a bit down the. Boat. Oh well, an old man Crook's boat. Mm. Ah yes, yes. That that figures that he was roof and building service or something, wasn't he? I think Crook he was timber. Timber, timber, yes. Because they still are. Mm. But, uh, they were, uh, what's left of them are still. Because they went to school with me. Yeah, interesting. So, ah, well, so there you go, Bill Miles, and you were the driver. I was the driver. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And so after uh, Maltz, you said you went uh, to... I went to work for Theo Thine and Associates. Yeah. I was very lucky because they asked me to go there, and I can't remember who... I think it was Nev Miller moved on to um, um, Theo Thine's office. And they were good. They were known as a good design office because working there was Robin Gibson, Don Winson, who was a superb draftsman, not a great designer. Uh, Rob Gibson, who was fresh back from working for Sir Hugh Casson in London, and he was full of uh, overconfidence and you know whatever. And um, so Theo really ran an office. Um, based on his wife's wealth and um, what houses houses um, uh, the uh, you know, I'm trying to think um, we did houses but we did houses for generally people who were in business like uh, John Mills himself who was a printer mm -hmm. in town yeah. we did a house for them at St Lucia when St Lucia had dirt roads um, and um, also they did the um, Chamber of Commerce building up in Wickham Terrace, right at the very 
mm. up near the Theosophical Society mm. that I'll build. Mm. I, I got it wrong, I think, Rob, but you know, what I, you know what I mean. And that was an early Rob. He was the instrumental in designing that, which was a, a very smart modern building when it was first built. Um, and I'm trying to think. Um, that scale of building, uh, a very nice factory for Butterworth fishing rods in Stanley Street, South Brisbane, which mm -hmm. was done in a sort of uh, be, um, column and beam frame, concrete frame with infill, which was quite mm -hmm. uh, very modern for its day, very advanced for its day. And um, um, that's of course all the, all the South Brisbane stuff's gone, of course, with the uh, expo. Southbank. And am I rattling on too much? No, this is exactly um, what it's for. Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh, yeah, we had it. Well, it was a very good team at mm -hmm. Theothines. Michael Bryce joined us there. Mm -hmm. um, and he um, he was, he and I used to, he, was, he used to dress like a, very well, like a dandy, he loved dressing. And he and I had our VW Beetles together, so we became good friends over our <laughs> motor cars, and we'd go to lunch and stuff, you know, around the town in those days. Um, and uh, where did you go for lunch? Oh, oh well, we uh, Michael was in the University Regiment, so we could go to the US Club, mm -hmm. not regiment, um, no, the Air Force, oh. the Air Force. So we could go to the United Service Club, or we'd just go somewhere downtown to some little place and I used to meet Russell Pearson sometimes at the uh, Salon Curry House which was in Edward Street which has gone wrong of course yes, yes. you know yes. so um, uh, yeah so Michael worked with us and then while I was there Gabriel Poole turned up huh. on the doorstep one day having come in from Jackarooing and starting to do architecture and while he was working there, hang on, let me think. Now, Gabriel did come to Theo's for a while, yes. Yes. Because in show week, I have this memory of Gabriel turning up one morning in his dinner suit. And in show week in those days, there were endless parties we all went to. And um, uh, Gabriel, of course, had overstepped the mark, hadn't he? He hadn't been had time to go home. He'd just sort of come in through the office <laughs> in his dinner suit from the party the night before. But um, So it was an interesting office because mm. Gabriel was, e even then, a, a, you know, a thinker and, a, and an architectural enthusiast. And we had Robin Gibson, who was you know, pretty forceful and a good person to be around at that time, really. If you could put up with it, you learned to be. And um, where was the office? And I was also the driver again. <laughs> the, o the office was in the Colonial Mutual building on the sixth floor. And we had lovely George, the lift driver. That's next to the GPO. Yep. We were on the sixth floor next to, um, what's his name? Fitz, the dentist, the fashionable dentist of the time. And um, we had rooms each side of the corridor. The secretary sat this side and we were on this side of the corridor and um, I remember it's, we had Laurie West's Batoya chairs which the welds weren't too good on on the front and they the little wires would lift where they'd been welded at the front and a few of the clients ladies did their stockings in on those so that was not good but from a, my point of view to walk into that office after Moles and McMinn it had Batoya chairs mm. We had um, very nice cabinet work with, you know, graphic yellow doors and the, the proper mm. feeling for an office. Mm. And um, so it was a very stimulating place to work. It was good. So then Rob Gibson went from there to his own practice mm. and then he rang me up and said, come and work for me. There's a lot of poaching going on. Oh, yes. And with the, the, I was very lucky because I was the poached. I was poached, so I never. One of the things I often look back on is that I never have to ask anyone for, for a job, other than the first one. Really? So I I just moved from one office to the next. 
So, um, and when was that? When the, the Twelve and Gibson started as a little bit? Ooh, let's think. Um, would have been about. I went 60. I'm thinking it would have been about 1960 mm -hmm. or thereabouts. I'm not quite sure, but I think. Yeah. So I stayed with Rob, endured it. Um, um, and he got Gabriel to come there as well. Gabriel was with us at Rob's. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who else. I think Don Winson came because he was such a fantastic draftsman, so Rob needed that sort of backup. And at Rob's office, one of the great things we did was submit a, a and this might give you a purse to dates, we submitted competition entry for the Sydney Opera House mm -hmm. and it's one of those wonderful things I always remember because you know you worked night and day and all that sort of thing and it was the first time I'd ever experienced that degree of um, uh, architectural involvement you know and, mm -hmm. and uh, devotion to this. Was it any good? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> Rob designed it. Mm. It should have won. <laughs> but Yes, so that, that, was, that was great fun, yeah. doing that. It was fantastic. Um. So, yeah, then, then at the end of my time at Rob, my life changed again. So, yeah. so how did um, Theo react to half his staff being... He got more so staff, he got other staff. I don't think he liked it much. Mm. I can still remember him saying to me that when I said I was going, he said, and I had lost interest, he said, I think you've lost interest a bit. But he was, um, I, uh, Theo, as I was again the driver, oh, I know who else, I know who else worked for Theo. Important, John Dalton. Mm -hmm. John Dalton. Mm -hmm. So he had, you know, a great team at, um, at Theo Thang Associates gathered around him. Mm -hmm. And I was the driver again. We had an old Holden because neither Rob Gibson nor John Dalton drove. And I'd have to take them to the jobs. <laughs> and I remember taking them to one job at Hamilton, um, Peter Sachs' house at Hamilton, and there was this sort of, uh, Rob was very objectionable on site, and um, there was this brick going just past him, just, just, <laughs> just to let him know. <laughs> and um, so, um, and was one job where Rob used to take Gabriel Poole, who, um, one of Gabriel's sporting prowess, his sporting prowess was boxing. So I remember Rob saying, come on, Pooley, you're coming with me today. I'm going to have a bad day. I'll need you. I may need, I may need you. <laughs> <coughs> um, so that, and then you stopped working at uh, Robin Gibson's office when, when you well, finished yes. the... Well, what happened was that Oh no, we, I mean, we did the competition yes. stuff. We did lots of other things. And one of the things I've got a bit of a gap about is I can't remember the buildings we did or in, in what order. Because mm. it was way before the cultural centre. Yeah. yeah, but it was things like uh, the Milano restaurant or. Yes, uh, no, a bit, uh, a bit of shoe shops. shops. A bit after me. The shoe shops. That's it, Major. Oh, yes, yes. I was chief. Um, liaison, drawer, and uh, Mathers, and then again, then Wallace Bishops. Ah, yes. The Mathers Shoe Shops. Thank you, Rob. I'd forgotten. Uh, because that was a big part of my life with Rob. Well, we used to talk about Rob's work in, in a way that was probably a bit um, derogatory. Yeah. And that they were all the same. There was a formula there. Glass, brass, black bean, bean and, and ass. ass. Yes. <laughs> well done. Yes. That's right. I'm glad you could remember it. Yes. Yeah. But, but I mean, looking back, I mean, they were at a level that set them apart. Oh, absolutely. Frameless glass, you know. Yeah. We, I mean, but which had frames which we had to hide. But, you know, sort of. but there were a few people doing this. I mean, Jeffrey yeah. Pye was doing this. Yeah, a bit later, though. Yeah. Because Jeffrey oh. worked for Rob at one stage. And uh, who else? Well, I can't remember. But yeah. 
But Jeffrey's a bit later than Rob. So you think Rob sort of uh, yeah, he uh, was introduced the, these things? Yes, I do. I, I think I think very much that because Jeffrey's younger than Rob. Jeffrey's younger than I am. And um, he worked with Rob, so he would have learned a lot of the tricks there mm. uh, and then applied them. And well, that's fine. Um, but oh yes, I used to go have to go to the shop would be opening and I'd have to go and see Mrs. again in the car, I'd have to drive over to the West End, see Shirley Gerlich, who made the, all the curtains because every window had curtains as a backdrop. And she'd make all the curtains and she always the same colour? Um, well, blue for Wallace Bishops mm -hmm. and I think it was cream for neighbours. But Wallace Bishops were blue because they used we used uh, walnut there instead of black bean often the old Queensland walnut, and um, Rob worked out the shoe rack things to display the shoes, all that stuff, and I'd often have to be there to sort of supervise the last gasp, you know, of the thing, of getting the last of the carpet down because the shop's opening in the morning and you know, all that sort of stuff. Mm. So, Hugh Casson, you mentioned that Rob had worked for. Yes. Um, what do you think he got from that? I think he... Um, I don't know. He, he must have... He, he got a... Um, I think he got a sense of probably European design mm -hmm. from it and probably a slightly internationalist sort of feeling. Um, he got on well at Casson's um, because he was probably to them an oddity because Casson's office was a fairly um, what was establishment mm, to deal. But it was also um, doing sort of good stuff. Oh, good stuff, yeah. And I'm trying to think, Gabriel, when Gabriel, he went to England um, and he worked for Cadbury Brown. Uh, and I'm trying to think which one did the Royal Academy building next to the um, Albert Hall, whether it was Casson or Cadbury Brown. No, it was Casson. It was Casson, wasn't it? Was it was the Royal College. The Royal College, mm. the right. yeah, that's right. Um, there's a new magnificent one now in South London called the Dyson Building. Magnificent mm. new building. Because mm. they obviously outlived the, the old one. What, the Royal College? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, the, the buildings have to... They, they grew beyond the building that is near yeah. the Albert Hall. Must be very new. It is very new. Just finished about a year ago, because mm. I go past it in the bus when I mm. go to London. Oh. And um, so, yeah, I, I, he gained a lot from it, I think. And all, the, if, if, all Rob's um, drawings had little people, on the, in them, and they were the little people with little heads, mm. and they were pure Hugh Casson. I know you got that. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, you, you, how long did you stay with Rob? Well, I stayed with Rob um, till 1963, when I got married, mm. and he told me I shouldn't marry the person I married and I'm still married to, because she wouldn't be good for my career. Mm. <laughs> Did he marry so someone he was, who was He was that career? sort of person, you <laughs> understand? Um, and I don't think he married someone who was good for his career, mm. and perhaps he regretted it. Mm. Um, but um, because his, his marital thing was sad, so that, you know, that that's, um, because you know, first wife died, of course, and uh, so uh, uh, I never forget going to his house for dinner one night and his wife was there, but Twinkie's first wife, and we were all there, and there was nothing to drink. And he rolled in about an hour late, pissed. I can't think of a nice way of saying it. And Twink said, there's nothing to, there's nothing to drink. Go and get something. You know, mm. you know that sort of chaos. Terrible. So anyway, I wasn't supposed to marry him, so that, that was good. So and anyway, so we got married in April, and we both decided that rather than have children in the house that early in our lives, um, we would both 
wanted to go overseas. So in January of um, 1964, we went to live in London. And we lived there for two and a half years. We went for 15 months. And we had such a wonderful time. And the office I worked in was, was a good, it was a good solid job. So and we, and we had a lovely time. Which office was it? And we, I worked for the Owen Luder Partnership in, the, in, in London. Um, Owen Luder eventually, later on in his life, long after that, he, he was president of the RIBA for a while. And uh, we did a lot of, um, we were doing a lot of the brutalist stuff in Portsmouth, Catford, um, Sutton, big, big um, concrete brutalist buildings. Residential. Um, sometimes a, a mixed, very often a mixed um, shops, residential, and perhaps mm -hmm. a big car park and that sort of thing, because of the start of big car parks and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So broadly, that's uh, that's what the office did. I was involved in a lot of um, um, housing um, where um, uh, at Pinner, which is an outer suburb. Where they had there were big old houses, probably Victoriana type houses, on big sites, and in that period they'd knock them down, and amalgamate some sites, and then you'd build um, all these little terraced houses, um, tiny things. You know, that go in the front door and there's a loo under the stairs, and upstairs there's a little bathroom and a couple of bedrooms. And, was this in the days of Parker Morris space standards or um, before that? Don't know. Well, we did public housing that was had to be, you know, there was uh, a minimum size. So everyone designed to the minimum size, which was... Oh, well, probably it was. I was never aware of that. It was never mentioned that I can remember. Um, and we used to... Um, yeah, uh, and I had to work on those and supervise them and... Thing. There was no design in them really. They were just drawings, of drawings to suit the developer, and you know, that was it. Oh, but it wasn't public housing. So no, it wasn't public oh, housing. Well, no. We, we no, no, no. Be. Oh no, Mr. <coughs> the client used to turn up in his maroon Rolls Royce and have a look at things occasionally. And after working in Australia, it was really quite interesting because I take my little minivan out onto site up at Pinner, which was a fair drive, mm -hmm. and. Um, the first day I got there, I, it was of course every it was mud everywhere, and on a building site in here, it's always dust. And there was mud, so the builder said, "Listen, I think you, I'll get you some wellies for your next time." So next time I came, came out with my wellies. He said, "There you go, that's what you need." So they stayed in the back of my van <laughs> for a long while. So. And you stayed there for the whole two and a half years that you were in, in the UK, at that office. Yes, oh, mm -hmm. because they were very good to me uh, um, in '64. We'd had planned to take three months off and travel through Europe in a minivan with a two-man tent, and um, which we did. Mm -hmm. And they said, but come back mm -hmm. after that. So I came back and just walked straight back into the job. And then after I was there for a while, they put a proposition. Then it came time to sort of think about going home because you had to, you know, the immigration laws and all that sort of thing. We were getting to the end of our stay. And they said, Would, we'd like you to stay with us. So I tossed it up because we really enjoyed London because we were there in the swinging 60s. Yeah. We had a great time. We had good friends. The office was congenial. And I could have perhaps eventually moved to another office. And I thought, what I'd really like would be my own practice. I'd like a house in Hampstead. I want a barn in Suffolk. For a weekender, and then I'd like to go to Greece for the couple of weeks in the summer to swim in the sea, and I'd like a Rover 2000 TC car. Right? Always a car in it, really. Great plan. And I thought, if I stay here, I'll never achieve that because I will not get my own practice. I don't have the backing, and I'm not and I'm not pushy enough to to do it yeah. out of my environment. So I made a decision to come back to Australia. Mm. And in no time, mm. I had a house, and a house by the sea, <laughs> mm. and so. So 
yeah. worked out. It, it was the right. It was the right move, I think, mm. um, because we can still go back to London and have a wonderful time mm. and see friends and stuff. So it's you know, very good. Mm -hmm. Before we go on into your own practice, can we just backtrack a little to your uh, time at uh, CTC or uh, Central Technical College? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> um, do you remember who the teachers were there? Yes, at the um, time? Charles Fulton. Mm -hmm. He was the main man. Um, um, Aubrey Job. Because there was a, 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 com a firm, of course, called um, Job, Colin, and Fulton, mm -hmm. which, who was my father's cousin, Jim mm -hmm. Colin, and um, uh, Charles Fulton, and Aubrey Job. And Aubrey Job later joined up with Bob Froud, and they were Job and Froud, and Colin and Fulton went on to then change its name many times. Um, E.J.A. Weller used to talk to us down there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what they were teaching? Oh, I can't remember now. Isn't that awful? Um, well, you would have had somebody. Oh, like Athel Bretnell. Mm. Athel Bretnell. He taught um, interior design mm -hmm. and history of architecture. I can remember that. I don't know what Charlie Ford taught. I think probably design. I think you know um, projects to design. And mm. stuff. And, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of other people. And uh, it was... Uh, Days before Coltesh? Oh, no, uh, Coltesh, no, Coltesh was there. He used to do spes... Spesis, spes yeah. Spes writing in my day. Coltesh, correct. Because when I worked at... Oh, one of the building, uh, one of the firms, it might have been Moles and McMinn, yes, Miles and McMinn, I think it was, or at the uh, times, Eddie Tesh worked for us, who was a younger brother of Col Tesh. Mm. Um, and he worked, and who else worked? It's one of those offices. It must have been Pat Moroni, I think, also worked briefly in Theo Vine's office. Mm. Mm. Anyway, sorry. Um, and were there many, how many people were there in your year when you started? Oh, I can't remember. But there wouldn't have been more than, there would not be more than 20, mm -hmm. I wouldn't think. And the majority were men? Oh, absolutely. All of we them? We had, no, no, there was one young woman, mm -hmm. um, Barbara Lawson, and I take my hat off to Barbara. She was a very, very nice person, great to have around. You know, and uh, in those days, though, it was not easy for a woman. Mm. And did she go into practice after she finished? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Because um, I sort of, I used to see her a little bit, but I don't know where, where she finished up in terms of architecture. Mm. No, no. And which of your uh, and student contemporaries do you remember from that time? Not many. Uh, it, it's uh, that's a matter of memory. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of getting old. I think. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. You're very good. You've prompted me a few times, Rob. That's John Day worked there in those days teaching. He used to teach. Yes, us he would have. Yes, he would have. Yes, John Day would have been there. Yes. Yep. From R. J. McWilliam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, certainly, Athol. Well, there were people from uh, Middle London. Newell, perhaps, no, not Peter Newell, no. Lund, Hutton and Newell. Never Lund used to teach in my day, but that's a bit later. Yeah, I don't think they were teaching then. Probably they're too young. Yes. To teach. Because I, I approached them, I remember going to see them about a job. Because even though I had my father's cousin in Colin and Fulton, I said to my family, I said, I'm not going to go there for a job, I'm going to do this on my own. But I don't think Man I think don't think my name ever did me any harm, you know, indirectly. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't want to sort of lean on Jim. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did you think of uh, the course in general, your architecture education at CTC? Do you think it was good? 
you know, that's hard because education has changed so mm. enormously that um, we were all just pleased to get through it mm. um, and get on with practising, mm. either by ourselves or with another firm. Mm. Um, and I think, I think probably it was pretty inadequate mm. in many ways. Um, and that's why, for example, the best thing to do was to go over to London and work in another office, which was very similar to working here, but your eye was open to so much other stuff and, and life experience, which I think is always pretty good for practicing architecture. Mm. And when you say life experience, you said that you were traveling around Europe when yes, you were in the UK? Did for three you, months. Did yeah. you go see architecture or was it other? <coughs> uh, oh, you know, we made a point of going to uh, Montchamp. Mm. But you knew about Montchamp? Yes, and we found it. And the Chapel Doubt up there, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How did you know about it? Oh, through, um, through our lectures, of course. Oh, now, by who? <laughs> who would have told you that? Or was it at the UQ or the CTC? I think... I can't remember when was it? it. It would be built in time for the CTC. The other, the other place where you learnt a lot of stuff was through the colleagues in the office. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Who were older than you mm. and had, like for example, Rob would be talking about Hall all the time. Mm. Yeah, he was mad. Hall Booz and um, follower. Because in my memory at, uh, at QIT, no mention of modern architects at all. It was all, you, you learned history and that finished at the Renaissance. I think you're probably right, Rob, because of, I think, um, I think mostly you learned it from the other yeah. people in the office. Yeah, well, people told you about Frank Lloyd Wright. And yes. Paul, but yes. and so on, but you had to find those things out yeah. yourself. They we did it a little bit, um, I think, in our history of architecture with Apple. And I think we did it a bit in design mm. down there, because you knew about Frank Lloyd Wright and all those major people. Mm. But not as much as you learnt, I don't think, from your colleagues in the office. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, uh, so anything else that you remember from your trips around Europe? Did you know about Alto, for instance? Yeah, but didn't go up, didn't, I didn't go to, um, I did, we didn't go to, see any of his work. Mm. Did you go to Italy? Yes. Did you know about any Italians? Yes. We went to see the Torre of Alaska. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the Pirelli building. Pirelli, yes. Mm -hmm. Joe Ponti. Yeah. And I can remember walking around it and looking at this huge sort of footpath all the way around it, which was covered in Pirelli rubber. And, yeah. I can't remember other things, but certainly those major things, mm. but they were both in Milan. Mm. Um, I'm not a very good architectural traveller. I'm a, an atmosphere and sort of general traveller a bit. Um, but certainly we visited those buildings, yeah. Mm. What about in London? Buildings you remembered and admired there? Oh yes, the you know um, one of the ones I like I was enjoy, uh, liked was uh, Dennis Lasden's work, and he'd done a College of Physicians or Surgeons in Regent's Park. That was one to look at, and um, uh, well, and then the, the College of Art. Um, and a lot, of course, there was a lot of there was a lot of fairly indifferent stuff in London, mm. Gol Golling's Melville Ward uh, flats, huge blocks of low mm. rent flats, you know, and public housing, mm. which was all pretty awful. Mm. Well, Dennis Lester <coughs> did some of that too. He did some of that, and a friend of ours lives in one of his mm -hmm. uh, in London, and it's it is a better than 
a better development. It's, it was council housing, mm -hmm. and um, it's left near um, the Queensway, north of uh, Hyde Park. And um, it's an interesting exercise to go there because her flat's pretty much, you know, the, the basis of it is pretty much a time warp. Mm. Very small, mm -hmm. and um, but a nice development to, to move around in with its landscaping and its buildings are slightly better. Mm. And the Barbican, was that underway? I think it was. Probably being talked about rather than I think so. reality. Yes. Well, I'm sorry, I'm... I knew this would be the, the stumbling block with the building. So. <laughs> but, uh, well, what about the, uh, on the South Bank? I mean, all those buildings there, the cultural They're later. Buildings. They're later, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, Festival Hall was there. Yes. And we all know what that's like. Yes. A particular style, mm -hmm. very 50s. Mm -hmm. um, houses. No. No. You'd hardly see it, a modern house no. in London. Well, one of the partners in the office, he um, he had a house that I saw photos of, uh, and he built himself a timber house, a very interesting timber house for the period. And I worked on a house in London in that office for a bloke who had a lot of money, and he wanted to he'll put this house and infill it in behind was a piece left over in behind terraces in Kensington. He said, a very, you know, it's an expensive part of London. And he had this sort of little battle axe in mm. there. And I started working on this very modern house in there, which had to be concrete, it had to be insulated to the degree where he could walk around with hardly any clothes on and feel nice and cosy in the winter, and so on. So that was an interesting exercise, but I, it, it didn't ever come to fruition. And I think I left before it did but I don't think it ever would have been built. Um, so that was sort of an interesting thing to work on. But it, it got through the planning? Oh, no, I don't think we, we were doing it all. Um, we were just designing it at that stage, yeah. And planning was not, uh, wouldn't be quite, wouldn't have been quite as much an issue then as it is now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Uh, but what about um, your time with UQ, your last three years of your study, would you remember from that period? Teachers or students? Well, there was Prof Cummings mm -hmm. and Bruce Lucas. They were all still going. And Weller, I can't remember whether Weller was, at, I think he went to both schools, but he was there, E.J. Weller. Um, and I can't remember, it's awful. You said Bill Carr, is he? He was a bit later, okay. I think. He was a bit later. Came in towards the end of our time there. Carl Langer? Oh, Carl Langer, yes. Town planning. Worcesters. Absolutely. Worcesters. Lots of Worcesters. <laughs> yes. And Peter, uh, Stan Marcus Carl? Yes, Stan Marcus Carl. Yeah, you, you're better than me. Well, Would you like, <laughs> Nina, try and interview Rob we have. about my life? <laughs> oh, we haven't done that yet. <laughs> my architectural life. Uh, well, no. was that in the days when Beryl was Beryl, here in store? Yes, Beryl was about, I think. Or was he still with the council? Mm, I think he might have been still with the council, I think, yeah. I think so. Mm. Yeah. And anyone that stood out in particular? For no. no. It's all a bit of a blur, I'm mm. afraid. And so you... I'm you a bit ashamed that I can't remember no. those things. and. Uh, but anyway, sorry. You joined the equivalent year at yes, UQ. That's Do you right. remember any of those people? That well, I can remember Michael Bryce because we worked together and we were yeah. friendly. Yeah. Um, no. Well, um, that was probably a pretty small group by then. It was quite small. You yeah. only started out yeah. you know, with 20 and then you yeah. lose them along the way. Yeah, and then you double it up again. Yeah, at, at and later year. lost a few. Yeah, and uh, and I, I'm sorry, I, I have a very poor recollection. But you went straight through, so six years later you came out. Uh, let me think now. Just say, uh, hang on. Uh, I don't think I missed a year. Uh, was it sixty? Sixty-one. 
apparently I'm a little bit over misty here. I don't think so. I think I went straight through. Yeah. Mm. I know I went through that phase which everybody does of getting to say fourth year and thinking, oh God, this is going on so long. I'll pack it in and get a job and thank goodness I didn't. You know, got, got round that way. Yeah. Well, um, when you came back from London and yes. decided that, yes, you'd have your own practice, did you come back and start? Or did no, you no, no. I came back and worked for Conrad and Gargo, mm. um, where Gabriel was also working because Gabriel and, and Jane and the, their children had been in London at the same time as us and we all lived, um, we lived, we lived in Swiss Cottage, they lived in Hampstead, so we lived not far from each other in London and we saw some, quite a bit of each other in London. And when we came back, when I came back, I got a job with Conrad and Gargoth and then Gabriel got a job. And at Conrad and Gargoth at that time, he did um, um, well, those hospital, hospital blocks, jobs, yeah. yes. Blocks and I did, I worked on the SGIO building, in particular the theatre with Keith Frost. Oh, yeah. And um, had, that was a very interesting experience to work out a theatre mm -hmm. on the tightest site you could ever want to build a theatre on and an attendant car park, which was also extraordinarily tight, because the leader of SGIO at that stage wouldn't allow any room for it. Um, you know, he wanted the, his building as big as possible. And, um, and the, uh, oh, there's something I was going to say about the, oh, and of course, uh, they only built the theatre because to build the SGIO building, they had to knock down the Albert Hall, right. which was one of the few entertainment venues in Brisbane. Mm. And planning said, you've got to replace it with a theatre. So it was about 800 seats, I think, and was a very useful size. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's took a lot of my time at the SGIO building, working with Lou Haley. Keith Frost. Well, which are very different in their approach. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So Keith was very difficult, <coughs> very difficult person. And I, I, should, I shouldn't say this, but I, I, I got to the stage, at one stage, working with Keith, and I had to go and see old Brent Gargett and say, you know you've got a deadline on this. If you don't give, you know, in terms, I didn't quite say it this way, but if you don't give Keith a rocket, you'll never make it. So I had to go behind my mm. principal's back mm. and give it a nudge um, because we'd have all copped it. Mm. You know, we'd have all been mm. in the tin. And so, um, it, it, and it, 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 they, he was, uh, old Gargoth was brilliant. He very carefully redeployed Keith in a different way and made him feel really fantastic and mm. got things going. Mm. Well, that's a real skill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he, he, because uh, Keith was the sort of man that you, you, you'd cop it if you tell him to. Yeah. Yeah, enough of that. I, I don't, you, we couldn't have overlapped. I, I must have left there just before you arrived, I think. I think so. I don't think mm. we are. No, Ron, that's right. Um, and how long were you there, Colin and Gregor? Well, I, I was there for quite a while, and then um, then I got an offer from Bly Jessup Bretnell to go and work there. Poached again. Poached again. <laughs> <laughs> and while I was there, we worked on a Supreme Court building that was never built. Mm -hmm. and oh, I, I thought that was the one that did get built. No, they, they, they built a... a um, District court, metric. district court building, yeah. but there was a Supreme Court building that, that we worked on, which never built. Oh, so who, who's is, whose design is the one that's there? Well, it's a very new one, isn't it? Oh, not that one, but the, the, the one, one in George Street beside the district court. I think it's theirs, but it's a different design. Ah, oh. oh, okay. Because it took a long while to it had a long gestation period, if I remember. Because I was there at the same time. Well, we were there, you know, we were there at the same yeah. time. That's right. Well, I was working on the magistrate's court, which never happened either. Was that it? 
Yeah. Um, but anyway, that, that's right now. You, you, we were in the same office at that stage, weren't we? Yes. And Don right. McNibbon was in charge of the that's magistrates' right. court. Yes. But it never happened. But I thought the Supreme Court had, but I left. I was only there yeah. a year. Yes. Mm. And were there other projects that you worked on at Vigesa? I can't remember. No. And who was it that uh, stole you away from Conan and Gregan? I can't remember. I think it was Graham Bly, if I remember. Mm. I well, think it was, it was Graham Bly. Yeah, it was Graham Bly and John Voller were the sort of young... Well, John Voller wasn't much involved when I was there, was he? He was, I mean, he came in, because John's younger, he came in later. He was his father. Because old man Voller <coughs> was there. Yeah. That's um, right, John wasn't there. Mm. Meat Ant was there. <coughs> Meat Ant? But Mr, you know, old, old Voller Senior, oh. tall and thin, he was always known as Meat Ant. I see. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Well, he, he was very tall and very thin and he had a head and a thorax and a... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and okay. he was known as Meat Ant. Hmm. And okay. uh, Joe Orange and all that. No, no, Joe Orange was kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, was, um, you're very good at remembering. I, I'm hopeless. Leg. Oh, mind. David Leg. Poor oh, bloody. Yeah. Walking up and down the aisle uh, between the drawing boards doing nothing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> He used to talk. <laughs> what? He used to mm. talk about things. Yes, he did, exactly. But he was not he was not exactly a ball of fire, was he? <laughs> and there was people like Rod Christmas and uh, oh, John gosh. Waxner. Oh John Waxner, yes. Yes. But I they were all upstairs and I, I don't really know. You were downstairs. Up there. Yeah. I think I was upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh dear. And then after that, um, after that I um, and I, have, I, think, I think I've got this all wrong. I think it was after Conrad and Gargett. I, I, I worked with Gabriel Poole for a while. <coughs> we worked together. Not as, as a, a partnership. Not as, not as a partnership, but the idea was perhaps we would become a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that was not a good experience. That was after Bly Jessup. Now I'm trying to think, because I'm sure I went to Bly Jessup after Gabriel. So you were both at Conrad Gargan, Conrad and Gargan. That's right. And then I went to Gabriel, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then when he fell apart, um, I went to, then I went to. So where was his office? In his house, one of the, in the house he had designed at Graceville. Behind the king's behind the Rex King's house and on a piece of land. I think I went there once. Yeah. Yeah, and um, Gabriel's practice was done pretty much on Mr. King's overdraft, mm -hmm. which was vast, and yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't a nice experience, um, because at the time Gabriel was doing the wrong thing in his marriage and mm. it was, you know, it got all messy. Mm. So, and then one day he said, well, it's not viable, we've got to go, so. And then and he went to Bajasa. And after that you started your practice, or? Yes, mm -hmm. I think so. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm taking an awful long time. Mm -hmm. That's rubbish. Um, I started my own practice by setting up a sort of design for furniture which was sort of modular furniture, almost like IKEA but not knocked down, mm -hmm. but modular furniture all painted white. And it was a foolish thing to do, but I didn't lose any money on it. And set up a shop called Some Things, S-U-M. I remember. Yes. I don't remember where, <coughs> where it was though. Well, it was in <coughs> Carl Langer's old office. Oh, cool because Carl Langer had died. Gregory Terrace. Yes. And mm. it right was... at the grammar school. Yeah. And we, another bloke and I, who were working together on this, we um, rented it from Gertrude. Mm. And Gertrude said we had to respect it. And, oh, you know, the mm -hmm. and we had the top floor to start with, as a drawing office, which was a little flat, mm. and then downstairs was a shop. 
And I think in the beginning we might have had the, the flat might have been rented to someone and we had the shop. I can't remember. It's been a bit vague on that. And so the shop was um, an interesting thing. I remember one of our customers on two occasions was Zelman Cowan. Mm. So it attracted people who were interested in mm -hmm. that sort of thing at that time. Well, design. Design. Mm. And, you May know. May I ask why you decided to go into the furniture rather than... Well, because I always, I always enjoyed doing interiors. Mm -hmm. And I also enjoy doing houses. Mm -hmm. And house, I don't care what I do, house alterations. But it's, it's all the same, in a sense. I mean, it's they're design exercises. Yeah. And you just approach them in the same yeah. sort of way. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, furniture design's an interesting thing because it's so three-dimensional... You've got to make prototypes to test. Anyway, so we wouldn't, didn't have the production methods to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. We basically made it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Hammer, hammer, nail, nail. You know. So have you still got some of it? Yes, in our office now. All the bookshelves are part of that. Mm -hmm. And the drawer units, little drawer units. Mm -hmm. The chairs have all gone, I think. They've all gone. Because we made, it was all made out of particle board, which in those days, of course, if it got near water, it just turned to wheat mix. <laughs> So, um, so that was an interesting exercise, but what it did mm -hmm. was it gave us a profile mm -hmm. and then the architecture started. And two interesting things happened was when I worked in other offices, the blokes would say, now listen young Bob, if you're going to your own practice, do not get a reputation for doing houses and house alterations. It's death. It's awful. So I thought to myself, oh, I like doing houses, and you're not going to do them, so I think I'll do them, you know, sort of thing. And, um, and there was another thing, I, of course, you, when you get old, you lose it. But anyway, um, I decided that... Oh, and the other thing was, my, my father-in-law was a general practitioner, a doctor, and he said to me one day, he said, you know, Bob, if you get a few doctors... They all follow each other, doctors. Mm -hmm. They've got to do what each other does. You get a few doctors and they'll all come to you. And he was right. Mm -hmm. So I got lots of doctor clients eventually, mm -hmm. um, some of whom were friends or friends of friends, and um, lawyer clients. Mm -hmm. So basically I had a, a clientele of people who were fellow, or who were in other professions, mm -hmm. So that when I set up my practice, it was really affected by the up the vagaries of the stock market or anything like that, because mm -hmm. they always had some money, mm -hmm. and they'd take advantage of the downturn to change the house. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, if nothing else, a unspectacular but steady income, mm -hmm. which is what I wanted. And what were the houses they wanted like? What were their desires for their own house? Was it a modern house or was it more? Oh, no. I, well, one of the other things I did was I bought an, an old house. We bought an old house mm -hmm. in Corinda. And at that stage, if you bought an old Queensland house, you painted the walls silly colours and you treated it as a stepping stone to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And ours was quite an early one. In 1966, strangely, it was quite early mm -hmm. to have all the lino ripped out and the beautiful pine floors polished and the whole house painted white inside mm -hmm. because I'd seen interiors in London like this. When you'd walk around the streets, you'd look in and see the old buildings and then there's a really nice interior. Mm -hmm. And so I treated the house as a serious object with a nice place to live mm -hmm. but with modern trimmings. And that helped a lot, I think, with people who visited the house. Yeah. And then they'd see their own house or they'd buy old houses because that was the beginning of the buying of old Queenslanders to be redone. Yeah. So when did you buy that house? 1966, mm -hmm. oh. when we came back from England. We bought it almost straight away. And you started the practice about, what, 1969? No, 1969. 69. Yeah, 69 stroke 70, yeah, roughly. And that was with... Robert May? Robert May to start with. He and I did the furniture and we also did the work together. Yeah. And, um, and then that went on for some years. 
um, we eventually moved from uh, Carl's office because we were working in Carl's office at one stage. We were upstairs and downstairs with John Rigby and Bert Yardley. John Rigby, an artist and a commercial artist, and Bert Yardley, who was a commercial artist and advertising man. And they um, were working downstairs. And then eventually they wanted to take over the whole building because Bert got into advertising with Joan Yardley. And um, we moved into the bread house next door mm. where we set up office. In a white office with um, maroon and sort of dark black maroon and red trim and red carpet. Oh, very nice. It was very, very, it was very skip, very <laughs> schmicko. <laughs> and I still have my uh, white kevy chairs. We sat on our swivel chairs, the mm -hmm. beautiful kevy kevy chairs, little swivel chairs, and the. Uh, of course, we had to have Robin Day skid base plastics mm -hmm. as well, of course, with chrome skid bases. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so from there, um, when Rob and I parted, he went to live in Sydney. And uh, he went to live in Sydney. And I worked on my own then for quite a while, long while. Mm -hmm. And then... Chris and I became friends and we bought the building at Barden because, because Robin wanted to, Chris's wife wanted to set up the print shop and so we bought the building at Barden and uh, we're still there. Would have been... Oh, that would be 1981. Okay. And which buildings of the period that we're looking at that you designed, do you think stand out? Which house? They're mostly out the back, out the be behind the houses. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I can't think of one thing that I've done that really stands out. Mm -hmm. They're all just there. Mm -hmm. They all serve their clients' needs. Mm -hmm. And I'm a bit of a disappointment as an architect because I haven't got you know, I can't find things that are... I mean, I can think of the odd thing that in a certain houses that are really nice, is really mm. nice. Mm. But they're bits and pieces. Mm. Rob probably remembers better than I do. Uh, but oh. uh, you, you built yourself a beach house. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. And uh, it's still there. I'm yeah. going there tomorrow. Um, and that was nice. Where is it? Perigian, Perigian, yeah. Yeah, the 19, um, 19, oh, 76. I bought a piece of land in Perigian, right on the front in 1970 for $3,500. Because we were, we were, um, what's the name then, weren't we? We were metric. 66. 66, when we came back from England, that's right. <laughs> and, um, and so, yes, and... Uh, then in 76, built the beginnings of a house on it, mm -hmm. which is um, a sort of beach shack type house. And, uh, but you, you had, there was a term for this latticed room that you had. Oh, the meat safe. The meat safe. Yes, we've still got the meat safe. <laughs> it's lovely, yes. Then you kept, well, you, mm -hmm. the house presents to the street with two carports, mm -hmm. and then there's square lattice, you mm -hmm. know, made out of old-fashioned three to five-eighths patterns. I can never think of 75 mm -hmm. patterns in squares. Mm -hmm. And you go into that, and it's got a big volume, and it's got a brick floor, and that's sort of a room, mm -hmm. an outdoor room mm -hmm. that you go into where surfboards sit and, you know, it's, it's not yeah. you can it's sleep proper, in it. A proper beach house. Yeah, proper beach house. Mm -hmm. And it's got shutters you push out on a stick. You know, the plywood you push out on a stick. Mm -hmm on one side and the other side's where it sits in the bush behind the dunes. It's all old fashioned sliding glass. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, everything rusts there, so you have to be a bit careful about it. It's been a very good house actually, yeah. um, in that sense. And the other ones I've done up there, um, the, they're still loved and used by their owners 
Um, and we've gone back over the years and put in new kitchens and a bathroom here and something there. And it's, it's lovely. I, I, one of the wonderful things about my practice is that I'm, people I worked with in way back, I'm now doing things to their old beach house or their old house in town or building them a new house to retire to. And I've just finished the last house I want to do, which in Paddington, which was we had to keep the old cottage and build a house behind it. And that's for people whose beach house is near us at the beach and who are friends of ours. And um, that's their old people's house yeah. now. And that's the last one I want to do. So that's the, that's a really I really enjoyed that house, mm. and it's 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 an, I'm proud of it. It's a good house. Well, the only other one I can think of is the one you did for Rod Campbell. Uh, oh yes, the Stratty Rod Campbells. Yeah, that was the beginning of the Stratty practices, mm. the, and even you know Chris has had a big boost from that association mm. way back, and then it was Rod Campbells, and then the one next to it, which. I basically designed, but Chris and I saw through, was the, the you know, Sue Peru's house. Because that's based in principle on our house at the beach, where everything is as much as you can get at one room thick, mm. so you don't have double ups. But that one's got a courtyard, did not it? Yeah, it's like that. Mm. Yeah. So that you get one room, more or less one room and one room thick mm. around the courtyard. Which is a very different house to Rod Campbell. Oh, very. Which is very. vertical. And well. More like a terrace house. That's right. Well, he, that's the different clients, mm. of course. The different, different clients. They've been to Thailand, mm. Peru's, and they, they were impressed by Thai things. And one of the characteristics of a Thai house is it's usually elevated and it sort of there's a floor and it all happens on top of that floor, mm. which is b vaguely the principle we applied in the mm. Peru house, whereas Rod's house is um, a very different building because we want, they wanted a bedroom upstairs to see what view they could of Morton Island from there. Mm. Mm. And Is so it possible? On. Uh, it was way back, I think. It's mm. like at Perigian, we could see the sea from the top of our driveway, and now we can't see the sea just can hear it roaring at the bottom of the path through the bush. And that's the consequence of the house itself, really, because yeah. the, as you build the house, you, you shelter the trees from the wind, yeah. And, yeah. and therefore they grow higher. That's right. But also, um, the wonderful thing is that the, the, the dunes shelter us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, uh, but that, that beach house has been a great success. And... Um, so the other two that I've done up there. The third one I did in our street up there was for John Story at the um, university, uh, the Chancellor of the mm. University. And I also did his house in St Lucia, which is a nice house. Yeah. Um, it's a very conventional looking house, but it's a very, very nice house. But it's a new house. Oh, well, it was a new house, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, have you ever done anything that's not a house? Oh yeah, I, yes. I've done, um, I've done some shops, mm -hmm. and interiors, and um, like solicitors' offices, mm -hmm. barristers' chambers, mm -hmm. things like that. In my time, yeah, I've done Fitz, Tony Fitzgerald's chambers years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, and because I did, was working on his houses, his alterations to them. Mm -hmm. And I did a project for him at Perigian, mm. which was an investment project of two, sort of a duplex. Yeah. And um, in your designs, were there any architects that you could say are inspirational for your own practice? Uh, um, yeah, I, I tried to think of that. And I threw some down. But I think. No, no, I, no, 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 not really. Um, I'm trying. I, I suppose there must be someone. Mm -hmm. Well, you would have looked at magazines. Of did course. Did you? I looked at. I may. I know that there's certain things. We used to get Avatari, mm -hmm. an Italian magazine, 
and that was wonderful. I think I got lots of uh, inspiration out of Avatari because it was European, it was different, and, mm -hmm. and it had sometimes very modest houses in it, mm -hmm. not grand houses. And you, you knew other practitioners in Australia who you visited, oh, of course. and, and yeah. you yeah. had good friends. I, I can't remember who they are now, but in other states that, that you would well, have seen. Well, no, um, Ken Woolley's a friend, good friend of mm -hmm. ours, and uh, he sat in our beach house, mm -hmm. he, because he does the most wonderful sketches, mm -hmm. and uh, he sat in our beach house doing sketches, not copying sketches, but inspiring himself. And he said, you know, always says that that how our funny little beach house inspired him to do the one he did at Palm Beach, his beach house at Palm mm. Beach, which he has subsequently sold. Mm. And now they found that was a, a nice interchange of mm. things. And I'm sure there are uh, one of the jobs I worked on somewhere, um, must have been Palm Beach, Target, was the state offices in Brisbane. You know the state that one they'd want to knock down now. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. In George the, Street. The, uh, executive building. Executive building. You know, not not the, the one with the um, bronze columns mm. at the end of that street mm. and up near mm. his, and that was a dead copy, and I worked on that to Conrad and Gargett, and that was a dead copy of Ken's state offices in Macquarie Street in Sydney. It was we we I was sent to Sydney, I went to Sydney with Frosty. Who would, who wouldn't tip the bloke who brought the suitcases up in the hotel? He said to me, "Don't tip him." <laughs> so I took some money out of my pocket and tipped him. He didn't mind. He, you know, I just thought, "I'm not going to, I'm not going to work your rules." So it was a dead ringer copy. But of course, Ken's one was knocked down. Yes. For the Renzo piano, yes. mm -hmm. a very sore point. Yes. And, um, but he's doing nice things. I go back now and he's doing alterations to the Fisher Library, consulting on those mm. at nearly 80 years of age. So what do you think about the executive building going? Do you think that it has some qualities that no. should... Um, I don't think it has any redeeming qualities. Well, was it a, some sort of good copy or not? No, it wasn't, <laughs> because it, it, it was too dumpy. Ken's okay. building was much well, was taller, taller. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, and I don't think it's a great building. It wouldn't worry me if it went. See, I can remember Frosty having drawings of the, or photographs of the Pan American building to oh. help him do the first sketches on the SGIO. But oh. The difference was that the Pan American building was about two and a half times as tall, mm. so it had a very different proportion. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, the same applied to the executive building because mm. the bronzy sort of sheathed columns if they go up there they feel pretty impressive but mm. when they stop you know yeah, yeah but it's it's still um, a very good example of the time oh it is I didn't it's know that that it was so close to the oh, state office a, building but if you look at it mm. and if you look at photos of both of them you'll see um, but it was it was almost embarrassingly you know, mm. it was very... Did, did, was Ken aware of it? I don't think so. He may have been later, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't... Because there are patches also in, in your life where you, you don't see those people for a while mm. Uh, mm. because of things that are happening in their lives or yours. Mm. Um, so it might have been a patch where I didn't see much of him to know. So know. where did you know him from? Well, that's a long story. Um, I, I, Ken... When I went to work for Conrad and Gargett, mm -hmm. there was this very good-looking, very educated woman, young woman, on the switch, Virginia. And she... I don't, know, I don't have to tell you the story. It's funny. It's just, it's just stories. And anyway, so she, she's decided... She and I became sort of pals in the office. And she had her husband here, who was a day man at Bell Rankin's private secretary, Martin, you see? And Virginia's, uh, Virginia found me refreshing, because I was fresh back from overseas. 
uh, we thought the same way. And um, so anyway, Fef and Virginia and Martin uh, became great friends. So they went back to Canberra when he joined the Prime Minister's Department and we'd visit them in Canberra, they'd visit us here. And they split up amicably. Um, um, she got the Jorg Jensen silver, but he was quite happy about that. And so um, Virginia married Ken after Ken's wife had died. Virginia married Ken and Martin married, went to England and met a girl there, Frankie, and married her and had children. Martin and Virginia could not have children. Virginia couldn't have any children. Um, and whether that's why they split, but it was very amicable. Mm -hmm. And so Mar we'd visit Frankie and Martin in Sydney and we'd visit um, Ken and Virginia in Sydney. Virginia and Martin would see each other in the street in Paddington and still talk and have a nice chat and they come and visit us up here. Hmm. So that's how I met Ken, through Virginia. Yeah. Wow. And um, so, yeah. So then Virginia's father was an ambassador. So she lived in, um, gone to international schools and, you know, learned French and all that sort of rubbish. So she was a bit wasted at Conrad and Gard on the switch. <laughs> She eventually had a, um, a, a business of her own called Arts Management, mm -hmm. where she managed um, singers, opera singers and singers, and mm -hmm. Simone Young was one of her clients, and uh, Lisa Gastine, all over, all, a lot of the um, very well-known Australian mm -hmm. musical people were her clients. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so if you had to choose a building that was built, between 1945 and 1975 in Queensland that for you is a good building, which one would you pick? 1945 and 1975? Mm -hmm. I haven't a clue. Mm -hmm. Were you ever on an awards jury? Yes. In that sort of period? Um, somewhere, because I gave, who did I give an award to? Not you. No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Wasn't Who did the house at Maclay Island? Oh, Rex. Rex. Hmm. I gave Rex an award. Hmm. I was on the jury the year Rex got an award for the Maclay Island house, which says a lot about my approach to architecture because it was a small, simple, interesting little house. Um, so, um, I mean, I didn't give it in alone. Um, hmm. but, um, it was consensus. It was consensus. Hmm. Um, and... That's one, I had one go at the awards. I actually have one award that I won uh, for alterations to a house at St Lucia. Um, and um, I had a funny experience. I, I, I had one of my clients said to me one day, uh, oh, your flavour of the month. You see? Because I was. I've got lots of clients and, and they all knew each other. You know? And it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's, it makes it sort of easy in a way, but in some ways it's difficult. You upset one, mm. you've upset the whole circle. But uh, she said, your flavour of the month, your flavour of the month, oh dear, oh dear. You know? And I thought, if there's one thing I don't want to be, it's flavour of the month. <laughs> I'd like to be the taste of the next few years, mm. but not the flavour <laughs> of the month. So after that, I never ever put a sign on one of my buildings I didn't seek any awards. I went completely, I didn't do anything much more with the Institute, which mm. I got sick of the other people in the Institute committees. I'm not a committee person. Mm. And um, just, but, but to just beaver away working. Incognito. Incognito. Mm. As incognito as I could be. Mm. But prior to that, saying that, mm. I thought I'm going to, do all this. So you, you didn't do a job for your father in law. You didn't build a house for him. Oh no, no, he was not a rich doctor. I, d I did alterations to their house. I did some alterations on their house. And um, so the first doctor's house that you got was he said you get one doctor you'll get a whole lot. Yeah. That's what happened? 
Oh, probably even just working on their house helped. I might have got someone, you know. I, I can't remember the, the, you know, exact thing. And I know in Chelmer, if I go down um, Laurel Avenue, there are three houses in a row there, and each one of those has a bit of me in it. I like that. Well, three in a row. Do <laughs> <laughs> you remember where that is, the, the numbers? Oh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, well, I don't know the numbers, but I can show you the housing. Mm. The Pincuses and the Armstrongs and another one. And the, the Pincuses have moved. They live mm. in Spring Hill now. But, yeah, it's a, it was an interesting... And, I, mm -hmm. one, and one, of the inter the, one of the people, though, the first jobs I ever did way back mm -hmm. in... Uh, I suppose the early 70s, I, about two years ago, finished an old people's house for them in Barton. It was a, they bought a little brick house and we added some stuff on the back and a nice little terrace at the front and fiddled about with it. And so, and I'm still, the other day I did some more work on that mm -hmm. and I've done three beach houses for those people as they sold one and moved on. And that, it's, that's been that sort of life, you know. It's nice. Yeah, that sounds ideal. It's all right. It's all right. I, mean, I, uh, I look at things that you guys do and think I'm, I don't put enough... I don't seem to put enough um, design into things. I just... They just need to fit the client. Yeah, that's I don't push the client too hard, put it that way. That's good, I think. But the reality is... As soon as you start employing a big staff, you don't have the control over everything unless you're a Robin Gibson who sort of rules. Yeah, that's right. Um, people do what you do yeah. on the jobs yeah. which they're for their clients and they keep the client happy. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe you can influence a bit, but mm. you lose that influence as soon as you have staff. Oh, absolutely. Yes. How that's many very staff good. have you ever had? Oh, perhaps the most I've ever had would be two way back. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in the old days, mm -hmm. uh, Janina, um, everyone had to have a secretary because mm -hmm. men didn't type, you know. So yeah. way back, I had a sec we had a secretary. Of course, now I've learned to, do it. <laughs> as you can tell, I can actually send an email. Yeah, yeah, noticed. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's funny. Uh, the, um, no, you're right. And one of the other things I learned from Rob Gibson... Uh, one of the things I learned not to do was don't make the builder your enemy. Mm. Rob made the builder his enemy from day one. And I mean, we've I've had some very good uh, relationships with builders who will then work hard to work with you, you know. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of, a lot of people response in, in, in the, these, well, in your life. Isn't there? And that. Yeah. That's yeah. not a bad lesson to learn. But yeah. uh, one of the things doing domestic architecture, of course, is that it's very intense personally mm. because the people feel the building very personally and then th there's an awful lot of detail so that therefore you've got to get the builder on side as well. Mm. So you've got to work your... Um, uh, you know, you've got to have your builder talk and your client talk and... Mm. Just sort of assess everybody's character a bit, mm. you know. It's really mm. quite. Mm. I think I found that interesting, always. Yeah. And it's you avoided the bricks on the head. I avoided <laughs> the bricks on the <laughs> head. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, uh, is it that not many people worked in your office, but were there any that you remember that were particularly competent? Ah, uh, no. I don't think so. I, I think one of the I don't I don't know where they all finished up really. Mm. Um, no. I mean I I'm strange I employed um, in two on two occasions I uh, or two or three times I employed um, a young woman in the office mm -hmm. because it was an easy office to do that. I didn't have a staff of young blokes who would give them a hard time. So I had, I must have employed about three or four, I think about four young women for various periods of time who wanted a job. And um, 
because, because as I say, it was an easy, easy office to do it in, mm -hmm. because of, of the small numbers. Mm -hmm. that they were, there was no sense of intimidation for them, which there was in the old days, of course. You know. But you were in competition with people um, for the work that you were doing. Um, who do you think were you competing against? I mean, John Dalton, were you ever competing against him? For Not really, because John, uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm Jeffrey Pye and I sort of mm. would, have, would have been competing also within the same social milieu, mm. in a sense, because we know mutual people, mm. um, the same doctors and the same lawyers a bit. Um, Jeffrey again, probably more adventurous than I. Um, and probably had more difficult clients than I. I was lucky; most, lot, some of my clients have been very good to work with. Well, not all, but some. Yeah. Jeffrey built up quite a large practice. Uh, yes, he uh, did. In yeah. 1974, I worked there for a while and had so many people. Yes. 16 or yes. more, and then yeah. things suddenly stopped, and he had to. Downsize as you do. Yes. Yes, I've never had to do that, and that's been the advantage of being very low key. But who, who um, of the other house designers, who do you think was any good? I'm trying to think. Uh, there were, must have been. I mean, John Dalton, obviously, you know, was he was good. But uh, to look at a John Dalton plan today wouldn't pass muster even vaguely. Mm. Mm -hmm. Bedrooms, 2,400 by three metres, which is what was considered a child's bedroom you know, yes. in those days. Mm. Well, we talk about minimum stage standards in Britain, but we were doing the same thing, and everyone was trying to reduce Absolutely. the cost. That's right, you know, exactly. We, we weren't a wealthy no. nation. No, that's but right. And things have gone mad now. And... Um, no, there, there must have been people, Ron, that I admired. Well, what about Beryl? Oh, yeah. Well, he didn't do houses. No, he didn't do no, houses. He did some good things. Yeah. I, don't, I, you know, I, I mean, any of them that you liked particularly? His jobs? Hmm. I think the Tuong Library was a, a lovely little jewel, really. You know, fairly practical in the varnished timber and all that sort of thing, but a lovely, a lovely try. The old car park's pretty good if you're going to have a car park. Mm -hmm. All that sort of thing, yeah. Um, and, and at the time, particularly good, you know, and they've weathered pretty well, some of those buildings. And what about Carl Langer and, and the things that he did? Oh, yes. I mean, the Lennon's Broadbeach or...? Well, Lennon's Broadbeach, oh, I think that was a wonderful thing. I was looking at photos of that the other day. And I remember it. I, I, as a young person, I've been there, you know, to that place. Yeah. And it was sitting in that desert of sand. Yeah. And it, it was fantastic, really. You know, the shapes of the swimming pool and the, mm -hmm. the layout of the whole thing was quite fantastic. Well, yes. how do you compare it to, say, the Chevron, which was the other bit of architecture down there? Well, it was crook. <laughs> it was dead crook. And we used to go there for drinkies too, but he said, hurtling about in our cars, and <coughs> we put, wouldn't have been able to, wouldn't have passed the bag test. Um, and there, somebody else I just thought of, um, Hayes and Scott, of course, were wonderful. Because mm -hmm. in, the, in the 50s, my parents had a house at Surface Paradise. Mm -hmm. And at the end of our street, there was the Robertson House, mm -hmm. which was a Hayes and Scott. Down the road was Mrs. Fitz and Myers butterfly roof and at the back of us right behind our back fence was um, Mr. the Blockies house which they did which was an American ranch style mm. done in varnished cypress and white windows and uh, across the road from that was a, a nice American style house some of the architect did that for the, Murph the Murphy family but Hayes and Scott um, mm. in their day did really beautiful houses. Mm. Was it seeing that architecture that uh, inspired you to study architecture? Uh, I suppose so, but 
as a as a child, I drew all the time. Mm -hmm. I had lots and lots of motor cars, and then later on, lots and lots of houses. Mm -hmm. I'd copy houses out of books mm -hmm. that were around the house, and um, I was the kid who was always in the, you know in the prep school, pri uh, primary school. Oh, Bob, you take your you take your um, drawing in and show two B. If I was in two A, uh, and I'd have to go in and say, "Yes, that's the same." I said, "I've got to show the drawing." So there you go. What about Morris Hurst? Is he run like Morris Hurst? Morris Hurst. Um, yes, as a nice man, an amusing man. I never forget the the Hurst and Morton show. They came, they would have come to the university when I was there to lecture. Right. I think as guest lecturers to start with. And it was like Morecambe and Wise. <laughs> it was genuinely the Hurst and Morton show. John Morton and Laurie Hurst. It was so amusing and it's so, what they said, so grabbed you because they made it amusing. Mm. And they were both Englishmen with their English accents. They were perfect. And Morris did some nice bits and pieces about the place. But I remember Morris more as a man than as a, an architect, if you know what I mean, and, and his ability to get a message across and to teach. I think that was fantastic. Um, and John Morton as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, um, and I suppose uh, there must be other... Who else did that? Nice houses. Well, Caro Nutter oh, and yes. Charlton were a good firm, I don't know. Good I'm not firm, they, did, they were not very exciting. I'm not aware of any They did this building. Did. Yeah. And, uh, um, no, they did some houses, but uh, not many, I don't think. Because that was that thing don't get a reputation for houses. Mm. So a lot of them didn't do them. Mm. And, uh, yeah. Rob Gibson did, of course, some amazing houses in his day, very much based on international style that he'd been influenced by in his time overseas. All done in fibre, of course, white painted fibre. Some of them must have been concrete, mustn't they? That houses, I suppose that must have been a concrete house somewhere. I, I, I think you've got mm -hmm. probably all you can get from me. Yes. And I'm sorry I'm such a dart about other people's buildings and mm -hmm. stuff. It was perfect, no worries.